Hello and welcome all. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, and uh, if, I, if there's an issue with the audio, please uh, type it in the chat right now. So welcome all. So I'm going to ask all of you to stay muted until the very end when we'll have a Q&A. If you have questions in the meantime, please do feel free to type them in the chat and I will address them at the end. I'm Leslie Sobel, and I'm going to talk today about my work focused on connecting climate, water, and data, specifically looking at the work in this exhibition about harmful algae blooms on Lake Erie. I'll begin by acknowledging that I made this work on the land named for Michigami, the world's largest freshwater system, and located in the Huron River watershed, land stewarded by Nisi Ishkawanan and Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires people who are the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandot nations. And I present this work on land stewarded by the Tonksis, Sikogs, and Wangooks peoples. So I'm going to share my screen and show you a bunch of images now, as soon as uh, it's turned on for me. And uh, so just a brief moment, and then it'll be here. There we go. Okay. So my work starts from concern about the intersection of the climate, climate crisis, I can talk, yes, and pollution. I work from both experiential and intellectual perspectives, aiming to bring head and heart both to these issues. Climate and pollution issues hit everyone, everywhere, and making work about my own region has that extra oomph because it's talking about home. I grew up on Lake Michigan, but these are images of Lake Erie, and I've lived most of my life among the Great Lakes. So for me, this is a deep personal connection. Our Midwestern waters, the Great Lakes and river systems are the arterial lifelines of the continent, and they really speak to me deeply. My practice is based in the intersection of science and art. This body of work was greatly facilitated by scientist Christine Kitchens, who works at the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research, SIGLER, which is part of NOAA and is in Ann Arbor, where I live. The photos in this presentation are a mix. Aerials come from NOAA's public Flickr set. Photo micrographs with a ruler on the bottom right are used courtesy of Christine Kitchens and SIGLER. All other images are mine and any errors, especially of the science in this presentation, are mine and mine alone. So I live between Toledo and Detroit, two big industrial cities that both have big issues with pollution, climate injustice, and economic injustice. And Toledo in particular, which is right on the western end of Lake Erie, which is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, and the image you're seeing now is the area that this work was all made in. So this is from Google Earth. And when you look at it, you are looking at the mouth of the Maumee River. And a lot of heavy industry. Toledo is called Glass City because it's one of the major manufacturers still of glass in this country. And uh, it's also an area where you've got super heavy industry, oil refinery, coal plants, the aforementioned glass, still some Great Lakes shipping next to recreation, right next to agriculture, and right next to residential areas that are mostly pretty poor. And this stuff is all cheek by jowl. It, it's kind of shocking how close together it is. Your, that circle is maybe three miles in diameter, maybe. So when I got interested in this area, I've known Christine for a while, and I knew she'd been working on algae blooms. And she sent me to Maumee State Mommy Bay State Park to see the bloom up close and in person. And all of these photos you're seeing of the bloom are unaltered in any way. This, it really looks that green, that luminescent, it's scary. It's a weird state park. There's a golf course, which is heavily fertilized. The first time I drove in, there were big trucks mowing and dumping pesticide and fertilizer. And it's right on the water. So all of this stuff is running right into the water. There's a convention center there, a marina, beaches and nature preserves, all right there. And to get there, I drove through heavy, heavy industry. And the day I was there, this sign was on the beach. And uh, 
when you go to a public beach in a state park and what you see is stay out of the water because it's dangerous, it's food for thought, it's disturbing. Why is it happening? It's a mix of pollution, agricultural runoff, excess nitrogen from that uh, runoff causes the algae blooms, and excess phosphorus makes it toxic. Climate change adds more heat, more energy to the system, and torrential rains, and all of that feeds the bloom, not to mention increased CO2 in the air and then in the water, which makes it more acidic. So it, it's a bad combination of things. How do I respond to this as an artist? In a bunch of ways. I look at photos. I shoot my own with this antique microscope as well as a little tiny field microscope. I use microscope scopic images provided to me by the scientists, which are much higher resolution. I use also other images. So these, this is from my microscope, as is this. This is one of the scientists' images, and you can see, obviously, a lot more detail in it, and here also. This is uh, some of the data I work with, looking at it. This is from Google Earth, and it's showing various points of pollution flow into it. And if you look closely at this, I could point out places where there's an oil refinery and a coal plant right on the water. Easy delivery of coal, I guess, but not so great for the water. I also look at satellite images, and this is a still from an artist book I made about that. I make artist books, I make painterly prints, and I make 3D pieces. Artist books in particular because they're a way to tell a story without necessarily using a lot of narrative. You can tell a story with a lot of words or a lot of images. So here, one of the dead muskrats that were lying right next to this manicured golf course and marina when I was there. I don't know that they were killed by the algae, but I wouldn't be surprised. If Christine is here, maybe she can tell us in the comments. This is an aerial of the heavy industry at the mouth of the Maumee River. This is not my image. This is, uh, again, from Noah's uh, imagery. But see how green it is. That is the algae, and it's not a good thing. I make a whole lot of mixed media pieces in response to it. And these pieces are often encaustic monotype. If you look at this image, you'll see these ball-shaped forms. And those are forms here, here's a micrograph, and I took the photo micrograph of that imagery and used a die cutter to cut it out to be a stencil for a print. So I'm taking those photo micrographs and using them very directly in printmaking as well as as a reference image. This is another one of these prints, which these are encaustic monotypes, which means that uh, I'm making a print on a heated surface with encaustic paint, which is a wax-based material that I work with heated. It's a kind of hybrid of very ancient and very modern process, but I like it because it's a very direct way to do mark making and make multiples in a series. I'm not very interested in making additions of prints. I want to make series that are re related to each other. I call me lazy. I'm, I'm more interested in the process of making one than the repetitive process of making a whole bunch that are the same. This is another piece in that series using some of the same imagery. Again, looking at it in a way to express the feeling of what is happening to that water, how things are changing, what it looks like. You don't get the smell, though. And... Uh, that's probably a good thing because the smell of these algae blooms is pretty amazing and it doesn't do good things to the water quality or the air quality. And the air quality in a major bloom is, is noticeably bad. And there have been several instances where Toledo has had to shut down its municipal water system because they just were not equipped to filter out the toxins from the bloom. And that's a really sobering thing to have a major city unable to use its water because of a biological thing that is happening. Toledo is putting a lot of effort into working with the farmers in the surrounding counties to limit the amount of fertilizer they use. I learned from my husband's work with Pioneer Hybrid years ago that farmers tend to dump way more 
fertilizer than they need. They, they don't measure it precisely because it's cheap and it's easy to just dump a lot. But the extra runs off and it's causing problems in watersheds all over the world. In North America, this stuff goes down the Mississippi River. It ends up contributing to a huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico as well. It's just, it's not good. We need to be more specific and pointed about using fertilizer and pesticides. I also make really big pieces in response to the to the these issues. This is uh, a large format encaustic monotype, as you can see. It's 42 inches by 63, so it's big enough to pretty well fill your field of vision. It's a mixed media piece. It's got some of the photomicrographs that you saw earlier collaged into it. It's also got diagrammatic elements to show what's happening with phosphorus with nitrogen with what's called the water column, because what happens with the increased storms from climate crisis is that you get water columns of turbidity that are stirred up so that the sediment at the bottom of the lake is stirred up by this increased rainfall, which means that even if you've improved the amount of stuff you're dumping into the water, there's a residual load of it in, underneath at the bottom. And that means that even as we change our behavior, much like issues with climate change itself, we're still dealing with problems that are lasting, that are there, and uh, that are going to take a lot of effort to address. They're not simple problems, and they have just a whole bunch of issues uh, contributing to them. So one of the things I like about doing these large pieces, aside from the fact that they have impact because they're big, which as a printmaker is not a given. <clears throat> and there's certainly a fun technical challenge to wrangling a piece of paper that's significantly bigger than I am. Um, and I do generally work alone in the studio on these. I've figured out some methods to try and subdue the beast, but the paper sometimes wins. I also work with a lot of mixed media 3D pieces. And these are pieces that incorporate, again, the photomicrographs, they incorporate cast resin, and the resin product that I use is an eco-resin. I believe it's made from hemp. It's benign. There are a lot of really toxic resin products out there, and I'm not working with them. I would be kind of hypocritical to make uh, work about the environment with poison. But uh, these are pieces that also incorporate found boxes. My friend John Katowski very generously gifted me with many, many dozens of boxes when he stopped using them in his practice. So uh, I'm well equipped to make these things, which are little shrines, really, for a very long time. And this piece, and you see the exterior and the interior, you know, multiple views of Mommy Bay, which was, at some point, I think, a very splendid uh, place with these steps down to the water but now they're steps down to really toxic water. It's a strange thing. So here's a detail of one of these algae pucks from another piece. These pucks are reminiscent of petri dishes, intentionally. Some of them are just painterly. Some of them incorporate photomicrographs of the algae, and they come in different sizes, or I should say I make them in different sizes. And... Uh, they get incorporated uh, into a number of these pieces. They're kind of gem-like, and uh, maybe that's a little bit of a contradiction because the algae is both beautiful and horrifying, and I kind of want these pieces to capture that because it really is lovely until you think about what it represents and what it means and what it's doing to, to the land, to the water. So this one, algal flow, is about 37 inches long, and the height depends on how it's angled. And uh, it's one of the pieces here in this exhibition, actually. Everything you've seen is in the, the real world exhibition in the gallery space I'm sitting in now. Last piece I'm going to show you is inflection point three. This is a little bit less specifically about algae blooms and more about the overall situation we find ourselves in today with the pandemic, climate crisis, extinction crisis, civil unrest, feels like we're at a point where 
everything needs to change in a hurry or nothing is going to keep going. And this piece, like a lot of my more recent work, includes a lot of words, which really don't show well in this kind of scale. You, you need to see it up, up close and personal, I think, to see it. But it's, again, taking all of the issues we're confronting and trying to come up with a way to respond to them visually. Think about what the heck are we going to do next? How do we change? I feel like we're poised on a knife edge, and if things don't change, we're really facing a potentially very bad time going forward. So this piece is not encaustic. It's sumi ink and acrylic and colored pencil and uh, art graph, which is a kind of liquid conti, and it's big. As you can see, it's 45 inches by 90 inches. I painted it with brushes on long sticks, which is great fun to do. You get to be free and gestural and big. And it's a piece of paper I've had for about 30 years, courtesy of my brother-in-law, Howard, who gave it to me a long time ago when he still worked at Polaroid. He said, what are you going to do with it? He kept asking me, what are you going to do with it? And I kept saying, the right project will come. And it did. I keep a lot of materials for many, many years until the right project comes along. And I'm never sure what that is until I am sure. And that just seems to be a lot of my process. It's a mixture of science and intuition and emotion and a love of color and a attempt to find different scales that speak to things because the problems we're dealing with today are so complicated that I can make something that's little like this piece and maybe that reduced scale makes it a little bit easier for people to get their hands and their minds around it. But then when I work really big, maybe it reminds you that these problems are really big and really intractable. And if we oversimplify them thinking, oh, we've got that little bitty thing we can hold, it, it, it isn't necessarily going to do it either. So that's why I work in multiple scales and multiple media. And at this point, I'm going to throw it open to questions. And uh, I think we've got questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to turn off my screen share, and uh, we'll see what folks have to say. So let's make it a conversation. So let's see. I guess from the sound of it, it looks like everybody was able to hear. Do people have questions? And Go ahead and unmute yourselves at this point, because I, I would love to hear people talk about uh, where they are in terms of these issues of pollution and climate change and how they live with it. What do, what do you all do about it? Oh, they may, okay, you may not be able to unmute, so uh, I will respond to... Uh, typed questions. Jackie and Richard say, how long have you been thinking about these issues and when was it clear they would lead to major art pieces? Um, I've been making art about some of these issues for decades, but it shifted more and more over the last few years, partly because of Nomad MFA and just feeling like I needed to respond to where we are here and now and not just in distant places. I, I went to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina to chaperone a service learning trip. And seeing the mix of pollution and storm damage there was really quite shocking. You know, you'd see high water marks 32 feet up a building and know that that was very dirty, toxic water and people were trying to live with it. So that was what, 2007, I think we went. And, uh, I've been making work in some way or other responding to that ever since. Although Richard and Jackie probably haven't seen a lot of those pieces, uh, despite the fact that they're in my home office and my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. Other questions? My si the scientists I work with, the question is, what is the reaction to my art by scientists been? Scientists are generally extremely excited to have somebody talk about their work and make it more engaging to the public. And I've done field work with scientists 
camping on an ice field in the Yukon, in the Southwest desert, here in the, uh, in the Midwest. And scientists are generally wanting to get the work out in a way that lay people understand. And data and statistics are not very compelling to most people. So generally, people are excited about that and happy to work with me, which has been great. Um, how does art and activism overlap for me? Very intensely, both in terms of this kind of work in a gallery setting, but also in terms of performance, in terms of teaching people to use graphics as a political tool. I've done a lot of freeway blogging, which means hanging big signs off of uh, highway overpasses. Um, so yeah, so it does intersect and it's going to more so. If that's a subject of interest, I'm part of a panel discussion tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time that Eco Art Space is uh, hosting. There are four artists who use performance as a political tool, and uh, we'll all be talking really specifically about that. Um, but yeah, scientists, to, to come back around to the question of scientists responding, uh, they've been very happy to work with me and very happy to help me avoid mischaracterizing their work which is something I try to be careful about. I'm not trying to make scientific illustrations and I'm conflating chunks of data and emotion, which are not things that a scientist is going to do with it. But I'm an artist. I'm, I'm trying to, to make it understandable in terms of how I understand it. Amanda Carlson asks, have I ever presented my work in the context of a scientific community? And how is the conversation different from art environments? It is different, I have. Um, some of those conversations have been in a tent on a glacier. Some of them have been in more formal conference sorts of settings. But uh, generally, they understand that I'm trying to be accurate without trying to make a statistically correlated presentation of what they're doing. But uh, it, it's a partnership because they can give me the information, but a lot of people who are concerned about these issues are not going to go read scientific papers and wading through them to the degree that I do is hard because I have a lot of knowledge, but not enough to know, understand say the chemistry. Um, Rachel asks, I hold on to, do I hold, she says, you hold on to materials for a long time until the right project arrives. How do you know? Um, what's that process of intuition like? It's an interesting question. Um, there's a piece in my home that's a large diptych of Antarctica, one side uh, just an aerial, the other side uh, heat maps showing melt zones and aerials. And I had the box that I used for that for probably 20 years. I didn't know how I decide. I guess I just start thinking, okay, what's the shape and the size and the format of what I want to do and what fits? And, uh, next question is, uh, is there a reason to continue to make art about pollution? Do I make in other regions? Um, it's an interesting question about where. I have focused really on three kinds of regions in where I choose to make work. High latitudes, because those are areas that are really the most sensitive, most impacted by climate change, most vulnerable, changing fastest, and places that we mostly don't get to. And I'm going to the Arctic Circle in 20, 2021, so ne next year, to work with it, but I try to work with areas that I have a somatic relationship where I can get my hands in the water, walk the place, be there. Because if it's just a place that is a place I've experienced from a technologically mediated way, it doesn't have the same kind of emotional connection as a place that I've been. And I have spent time in Puget Sound and Northwest Washington State. It's an area I really love and an area I would contemplate moving to. And 
So yeah, it's a place I would make work about. But there's also a feeling of presumption sometimes if I don't know it well enough. So I want to work with scientists who are there before I start saying, oh, I have something to say. I need, I need to know enough so I'm not doing something totally superficial. Have I worked with communities to support ethical relationships with water and what was that outcome? Some. I have worked some with local water stewardship groups where I live. Would like to do more of that. Um, the outcome really is trying to raise awareness. Um, have I ever had any political response in terms of policy changes? I've certainly met with policymakers. I'm a political activist as well and know a lot of folks who work in that venue, um, hoping to be on my city's environmental council going forward, although that's not a, a thing that's happened yet. So uh, yeah, I have and, and I'm, I'm working to do more with the policymakers about that. Jerry asks, uh, since I hold on to potential art materials for years, do I have a huge studio or warehouse? I have a big studio. At this point, it's probably a thousand square feet and a lot of it storage. And I'm trying to be disciplined about weeding it so that if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, my children won't curse my memory. But uh, yeah, it, I, I'm a hoarder, I admit it. I think all artists are hoarders. Are there new materials and mediums, something I'm considering going forward? Um, well, one thing I'm contemplating is uh, a drone or working with my classmate, Jared, who has recently acquired a drone and we've talked about collaborating. I've been exploring some new materials recently. The piece you see behind me has a lot of uh, material called art graph, which is uh, a different kind of paint that's just water-based and very matte and dense in color and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in love with it. M materiality is important to me. It's a, it's a big part of what I do and playing with materials and exploring to do different things. Yes, I can. So the piece behind me and see, I guess it's not a super easy way to put an image up right now, is, uh, so my trusty camera woman is going to zoom out a little bit on this. This is a piece that is called Pre-Existing Condition, and it has a map layer, which is an encaustic monotype of the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Basin. So you can see the map layer. It also has a layer that's a schematic of uh, lungs and bronchioles and uh, an abstraction of a rib cage and yes those are COVID molecules. What doesn't show super well at this scale is that a lot of uh, pencil shading is there which is showing areas of environmental injustice that also turn out to be COVID hotspots and I've done a bunch of work in Detroit looking at images there where a lot of the COVID issues, thank you Carla, yeah that's exactly the area, a lot of the places where COVID is hitting particularly hard are areas that are both polluted and uh, poorer neighborhoods. So it's not a coincidence and uh, it's not a good thing. We're really not treating people or land with good stewardship these days. And so the same issues to my mind that led to the climate crisis and the extinction crisis have led to our truly wretched response to the pandemic. And I think I can answer one more question before we have to take a break to set up for the next person. Are there any more? Did I miss anything? Don't think so. So thank you all very much for coming and listening to me talk about my work. We invite you to take the next 10 minutes to relax and uh, enjoy while we are going to just put a still up and quickly reset for the next uh, presentation, which will be Rachel talking about her work.
So time to switch from water to mycelial networks. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. 10 minutes from now. Right, so at 6.40, we will start again.